I grew up on a sugar beet farm in Idaho. It was kind of a small farm. We had small tractors, small equipment, but I still developed a love for farming and, and sugar beets. I grew up on a farm. We farmed until I was about 20 years old. Um, I spent six years in the automotive industry in research and development, and I thought that this job was a perfect reflection of my past experiences between growing up on a farm and working in research and development. So it kind of molded two parts of my life together into one. The main goal of our research is we conduct agronomic and variety research to provide data to the growers to make uh, both economical and agronomic decisions on their farms. Kind of a, a never-ending stream of improved varieties, um, higher yielding, better quality, and better disease tolerance. The other half of our research is agronomic, uh, in which we test things such as planting date, harvest date, uh, population, fertility, fungicide use, just any of a number of things that go into growing a sugar beet crop. We don't care what the outcome is, as opposed to a company who has a vested interest in the results coming out a certain way. Our research program is very diverse. We're testing varieties, we're testing application methods, we're testing fertility programs, and each one of those is a different treatment. Using our variety trials for an example, there was over 340 different plots within one official variety trial. So that's 340 ratings that have to be taken, it's 340 tags that have to be made, it's 340 seed packets that had to be packed at planting time. So it's a very time consuming process, but we feel like it's a very positive way to arrive at meaningful data that we can provide to the growers to help them improve their profitability and income on their farm. Much like any other growing operation, we're farming. So we begin with a planning process. What trials we wanna do, where are we gonna do them? That's how we start. In March, we start getting all the seed from the seed companies and we start putting them in small packets for all of the trials that we're going to do. And so we may pack at 15,000 packets of seed. We put it through the process where we have a seed counter or a lot of the packages are also packaged by weight. These envelopes are all pre-marked with the variety, the rep, the location. Then they get sorted into the order that they're gonna be planted so that when we plant, they're just coming down a line and you just take the next one. We plant in seven different counties, all three districts of the growing region. We usually have about 20 cooperators and we plant over the course of two to three weeks, uh, trying to closely follow the growers planning because we are working on grower farms. Planting research plots is quite different than how, how growers plant their fields. We have to have all these seed packets ready so that when the planter gets to the end of a plot, we dump new seed in for the next plot. And the planter, just in a short space, probably about this much length going this way, it sucks out the old seed and it gets the new seed on the planting plate so that it, it'll start planting the new seeds. We have three people that ride that planter and they're responsible for dumping the seed packets. Uh, we also have one person that rides on the back of that planter that monitors cameras that are on each row unit to make sure that seed is changing properly and to make sure that seed doesn't run out. The agronomy planter takes much more time. We plant small plot research trials. They're six rows wide by 38 feet long. So it will plant for 38 feet, stop, and then a treatment will be changed. Sometimes they have to change seed. Sometimes they have to change chemical. A normal grower with a 12 row planter can realistically plant 100 or more acres of beets in a day where we're lucky between our two planters to plant 10 acres. The reason why we go slow is to make sure things are done properly. For an example, one of our trials this year has 20 treatments. So that planter will apply over 200 different fungicide mixtures in that one trial. So to have those products measured ahead of time and make sure that those are prepared before we hit the field are critical. After planting, it takes the sugar beets, you know, a week to two weeks to come up. Sometime between 10 to 30 days after, depending on what type of trial, we actually have a crew of five to 10 people that go out and actually count the beets. That helps us understand if that treatment had any effect on emergence or if one's better than the next. In May and June, we start spraying test plots. That goes on for the rest of the summer. We make bulk pesticide applications just like a grower would. Beyond that, we have small plot replicated trials where we're testing different fungicides, application methods, and application timing. And what we do there is we measure out small volumes of the pesticide and we treat 38 feet of row and then the pesticide is changed. That allows us to test multiple products in a small area and get many replications which add to the consistency and repeatability of the research.
What we're trying to do is learn as much about these varieties as we can. So we go out, we do vigor ratings, and you just try to compare one row to the next row and try to determine whether or not they're consistent. We look at every plot and we give it a number based on a, a rating scale that we have. And at the end, we kind of average the numbers and come up with values. We uh, start harvest sometime first or second week of September. Our harvest is very precisely managed. Uh, we have plot maps that determine what plot number and replication each plot is, and we do a lot of preparation prior to going to the field. First we have to defoliate, so we defoliate a plot, and then we come in with the harvester. Three years ago, we began harvesting all of our trials with a customized uh, research plot harvester that was built from the ground up by a local company. It's a six row harvesting machine. It pulls beets out of the ground much like any other harvester with digging wheels and a paddle shaft. But once you get beyond that, most of the similarities are non-existent. Every single row is kept separate as the beets are cleaned and then each row is weighed individually. We're harvesting much smaller areas at a much slower pace than what the growers would do. Every 38 feet, we start and stop harvest. We need the, the beets to clear the machine to make sure we're not mixing one plot from another. That machine has improved our efficiencies and what we've done with that process is we've allowed ourselves to harvest more trials in less time with less people and provide better results while doing it. I'm, I'm really proud of our research harvest and what it's allowed us to do. Our research samples go through the same process as the tear samples do from a grower. They get dumped into the tear line uh, where they're washed, counted, cleaned and then reweighed to determine tear percentage and then they go into the new tear lab where they're run through both a betalizer and a nears machine to determine sugar content and purity. Another aspect of our variety research is storability. About 75% of our crop is going to be stored for a certain period of time and if we can figure out which varieties might store better than others then we can help to determine whether or not a variety should be stored for long term. So we have a room at our research facility that's humidity and temperature controlled, and we will store a subsample about 12 to 15 beets for about 130 to 140 days. And then we compare the sugar content and weight and purity after 120 days of storage versus fresh out of the field. Brian and I also have to have reports done and that's, a, that's kind of a big job. Any information that we've gleaned over the summer, uh, we enter into our statistical analysis program. And what we do with that information is we analyze it and try to determine whether or not the treatments were better or worse for any specific application made. Then we have, have a meeting and we show them which varieties you know, pass the tests and which varieties can, could be planted the following year. When we make recommendations, we try to go out on a on a smaller scale with different growers and that's part of our agronomy meetings as well. We provide information, they ask questions and we kind of go at it that way. I can understand why some growers might wonder why we do research and whether or not it has value. We work on usually about 20 different farms but we have um, like a thousand growers so very few of them actually see what we do. There was one grower, we've had trials with him for eight years now, and we finally had a trial right next to his house where he could see how many times in a week we come and go out of his trial. And late on in the season, when I was out there doing a plot rating, he came out to the field and talked to me and he said, I never knew how much you guys were out in the field. I never knew how much time and effort went into producing quality field trials. And at the end of that year, he really you know, became an even more firm believer in what we're doing and why we're doing it. They have to be able to be as efficient as possible. If they can have a better variety, if they can use a technique that will control their diseases, they'll have lower inputs and better yields and then have a better chance of making a profit. We put things through the riggers prior to them investing the time, money, or effort into testing them themselves. And we're doing it on a scientific basis over multiple trials and multiple years worth of data. So anything that we release to growers as a recommendation has been basically proven in our growing region to provide either increased income or decreased expenses. I think the most rewarding part of doing this type of research is being able to solve problems that you know, really make a difference to um, growers and grower families, as well as, you know, the Michigan Sugar uh, Cooperative. It could make 
the difference between them being profitable and, and not being profitable. It's very important and I can see how it affects my community and how it affects my neighbors and friends and trying to do everything I can to keep them profitable, keep them being able to provide for their families. I might be saying something completely different 10 or 15 years down the road when my joints are a little bit older and some of these injuries and things <laughs> catch up to me a little bit. But for now, I can't imagine any place I'd rather be.